You know, one of the things I realize as a pastor of a church that's now 71 years old, and as I read and study and understand why so many churches in our days, uh, time today are closing their doors, you know, one of the things we have to always be on guard for is certain traditions and uh, getting to a place and a point as a church and a body of Christ that you're unwilling to change to meet the current modern day needs and stuff instead of just being focused on the tradition. One of the other things they tell us when you read and talk about church growth and how you're attracting new members and when new people come in to make them feel welcome, to make them feel wanted is we have to be careful of our language. That when you've been in church and you go to church most of your life and for those of us who have been here for years, we have a whole different lingo that we speak inside the church that oftentimes people outside come in and have no idea what we're talking about. And so recognizing that, as well as the fact that in our modern day times, Sundays have become as much about football as they have about faith, I came across a list that I thought, especially maybe if you're a newer member or you hadn't been a, a member or a believer nearly as long as some others, but you are familiar with the game of football, I'll give you some new terminologies you can use, taking some football terms and applying them to the church to help you understand how things operate. But the first one we have is blocking. That is talking endlessly to the preacher at the church door and keeping everybody else from being able to exit. The next is an extra point. That's what you receive when you tell the preacher his sermon was too short. Then we have an illegal motion. That's leaving before the closing prayer. And a two-tenant warning. That's when the preacher's wife is looking at her watch in full view of the pastor. We got a quarterback sneak. That's Sunday school teachers entering the building five minutes after class has began. We got staying in the pocket. That's what happens to a lot of money that should be given to the Lord's work. We got another two-minute warning. That's the point at which you realize the sermon is almost over and you begin to gather up your belongings and close with your Bible. Then we've got sudden death. That's what happens to the attention span of the congregation if the preacher goes into overtime. And finally, we've got the blitz. That's the rush for the restaurants following the closing prayer. Just some football terminologies that we might can apply to our church. There was a pastor that lived in a particular community, though, and he was kind of upset because everybody knew him. He'd been pastor at this particular church for years, and every year they had this community gathering, all the other various pastors would be invited to speak, but he never had been. And so after enough years had passed, he was beginning to wonder and kind of get his feelings hurt. Man, does nobody want to hear me speak? And so finally the year came, and they asked him to speak. And he was so thrilled and excited, he couldn't believe it. And he got up there, and he spoke, and he just felt like he'd, he gave a great message. And after it was over with, somebody that had organized the event came up to him to offer him an honorarium. You know, that's a small monetary gift for him speaking. He said, no, 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 I don't want that gift. I have felt so privileged just being asked to be the speaker this year. I, I don't even want the gift. I'm sure there's a better cause that you could use it for. And the young lady said, well, actually, yeah, we do have a better cause we could use it for. And he said, well, just out of curiosity, what is it? She said, so we can get a better speaker next year. Boy, y'all just ain't in a laughing mood this morning. You take your Bibles and stand with me. This is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. My heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already, turn with me in that Bible. To Hebrews chapter 11, although we're only looking at the last couple of verses and then going into 12. Hebrews 11. Beginning in verse 39. And all these, 
having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Because God had provided something better for us. So that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Verse, or chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look into your word today, and as we celebrate 71 years of ministry here at Famont, I pray, Father, that you would help us to see that many of the things I believe they were experiencing then that we are experiencing as your people in your church today. Help us to see, Lord, also all that you are accomplishing, all that you have already done, all that you have in mind, in plan, and in store for us. So much so, your word says that no eye has seen nor ear has heard the plans that God has in store for his people. Father, help us, we pray, this day as your people to look back, to look up, and to look forward, understanding who we are, what you've done, and what you have called us to be as your church. We pray and ask you these and all things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Today we celebrate our 71st year anniversary. Now is the time, even as we just did a few moments ago, that we reflect on the history of our church. We think about those who have stayed, some that have been here for over 50 years now. We think about those who have went and moved away and, and served the Lord elsewhere in other places, in other parts of our state, maybe other parts of our city, in other parts of our nation. We think of those who have experienced the ultimate joy and now are at home with our Lord. So today we celebrate our homecoming. So even if Fedville or the surrounding area is not your hometown, even if your home as a child was less than ideal, even if your home life today is in shambles, even if your family is being challenged by what seems to be insurmountable odds, we invite you this morning to hang your hat for a little while. We extend to you an opportunity to reconnect with God and with His people. I want you to look around today. I want you to look and to recognize some of the familiar faces for some of you who have been journeying alongside of you for years now. There are some that have been journeying together on this walk of faith for years in this church through various ministries and Sunday schools and mission trips and all kinds of things, some of the uh, singings and the, the senior trips and the youth groups and all that you saw pictured earlier. I want you to remember those experiences. I want you to think about those moments that made you smile and smile again. Some of them that you can think about a particular memory right now and it always brings a smile to your face, if not a laugh to your heart. Appreciate the many faces, both the new and the familiar that are among us today. Make a new friend or renew an old acquaintance. But most important of all, redirect your thoughts toward a God who has been faithful to bring you to another homecoming season. So whether you're coming or going or you're already there, I've got a simple message for you as we begin this morning. Welcome home. Welcome home. Now, remember, there's always a little bit of risk involved when we decide to help other people. There's always some chances we have to take. We always have to beware, especially when somebody's trying to be nice and love on us too much. We have to walk out, watch out. There was a young man walking through a supermarket one day, just doing a little shopping. He just needed to pick up a few items before he went home. But no matter where he went in the store, he noticed that there was this old senior lady that was following him around. And she just kept staring at him. Well, he tried to ignore her for a while, but finally when he got into the checkout line, he was fixing to get into the line, and she kind of hurried up there real quick and got right in front of him. And, you know, he naturally, wanting to be nice, said, uh, pardon me, ma'am, sure, go, you go right ahead. And as they were standing there in line, he said, she turned around and looked at him. She said, young man, I'm, I'm sorry if I've been staring the whole time. 
but you look just like my son who recently died. He said, well, ma'am, I'm very sorry for your loss. Is is there anything I can do for you? And she said, well, actually, yeah, there is. Do you know just something about seeing you in here today and seeing your, your face reminding me of him? She said, after I go through this line and get ready to go out, she said, would you mind just waving at me and saying, goodbye, mother? He said, sure, ma'am, I, I'd be glad to. So he, he standing there at the counter, he thought about it, he said, well, man, what a great way to be able to brighten up her day. So as he walked up to the counter, she went on through the line and got to the front door and turned around, and he waved and smiled and said, goodbye, mother. Well, when the cashier rang up his items, he looked down, and instead of being about $12, what he thought it should have been, it was 112 He said, oh, oh, wait, I've only got a few items here. The woman said, yeah, but your mother said you'd pay for hers. It's time. 71 years. Do you know those people sitting in that first building you saw a picture of? Those sisters, and however few members they had at that time, sitting in a building on a little wooden bench with a dirt floor under your feet and an old wood stove sitting right in the middle of the floor of the building. Do you know if somebody would have walked in there that day and told them some years from now where we were going to be sitting today, they would have probably not been able to believe it. They would have probably not been able to get their mind around what God was going to do through their commitment, through their small step of faith that basically said this area of our city needs a church. It needs a church. It needs a Baptist church. Now, through 71 years, I can tell you today, Faymont has had its peaks and its valleys. But through the years, we have also persevered. The entire existence of this church has had its valleys. There's been times when they were discouraged. We often speak of someone in an athletic contest who gets trampled by his or her opponent. I'm sure there have been people before through the years here, for whatever reason and through various circumstances, that almost feel like that they had been trampled man it's discouraging to get trampled have you ever been trampled by life have you ever been trampled by your boss have you ever been trampled by somebody you thought was your friend i run into trampled people all the time in the ministry and so did the writer of hebrews and so to encourage this group of trampled christians the hebrews 11 writer presents to us a kind of a spiritual homecoming if you will He gathers together the names of those who have faithfully passed the legacy of faith on to the next generation. If you back up just a little bit from where we came in in chapter 11 at verse 39, he gives us a whole list of these heroes and these heroines of the faith. He talks about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham. He talks about Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and David, and Samuel, ones who kept the faith alive in their generation even though it meant great personal sacrifice to each one of them. The same is true for the fold here at Faymont. We need to keep the faith. We need to endure sufferings. We need to persevere through the trials that we'll face. And through that race, we'll see and be able to say just as the Apostle Paul did. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So at the end of his life, Paul said, all my life has basically been like a race and a fight. Do you know if you can say that today, as a believer, you're on the right track. If you can say, from the moment I said yes to Jesus Christ and invited him into my heart, my life in some aspects have been like a race and it's been like a fight. Because the, battle t- the Bible tells us about the battle that rages within. That's the fight, not to mention the spite. The Bible tells us that we're basically at war with spiritual forces of darkness that work against us. That is a fight in the Christian life. It's like trying to swim upstream. And it's also a race, not a sprint, but a marathon. So if you can say this today like Paul, that my life is basically from the time I said yes to Jesus, has been like a race and a fight. You're on the right track. You're on the right road. 
Can you say this in a commitment to the church? To prosper her for the sake of the gospel. To labor selfishly for Christ. Trusting God's promises. Walking by faith in the Son of God. Can we say on homecoming, day and night, by every means graciously given to me, I fought the good fight. I've run a race of perseverance. This is your church. God has entrusted it to you. It's not mine as the pastor. You know, one of the most sometimes irritating things that people say to me when we have others for here for funeral services and weddings and all that time, they'll say, Pastor, you've got a great church here. It ain't my church. That's what I always tell them. This isn't my church. It's not mine. It's God's, but it's also yours. He has entrusted it to all of us. He's just called me for this particular time to lead it. But it's not mine any more than it's yours. It's ours. It's his. This is the Christian life that you're called to live. And here's the other great part of it. Since we're all growing older, even those of you who are young right now, and I know you're thinking I'm going to live forever, don't even want to hear about this old stuff, but we're all growing older. Every second, every minute, every day, every week, month, and year, we're all growing older. But you never get too old in the Christian life to continue to grow and to learn. If you just open yourself up to these new experiences. There was the times change. The language and the lingo changes. The culture changes. But you can still be a part of it. There was an elderly Christian lady who wanted to do that very thing. She was almost 80 years old, but she just felt like she still had life to live and something to give, and so she wanted to experience some, some new Christian experiences. She went to this big, giant Christian conference that they do a gathering every year of various denominations with music and praise and worship and all this time. And for her, in all those years of serving God, it was the first time she had ever been to anything like that and mix with other Christians from various denominations. It really blessed her. It opened her eyes to the richness of various Christian traditions, not just the ones she'd known. And what she especially liked was during this particular conference, the pastor that was leading it said, you know what, God is moving in such a great way here this weekend. He said, I want us to go away from the norm. I want us to use a greeting for each other the rest of this weekend, the whole time we're here, one that was actually used in the early church. And he pointed out that the first Christians were so eagerly awaiting the return of Christ that to greet each other, they would use the word Maranatha. It's an Aramaic word meaning the Lord is coming. So the preacher told the whole entire gathering that weekend, he said, whenever you greet each other for the rest of this weekend, I want us to use this Aramaic term that means the Lord is coming. Maranatha. Just look at your brothers and sisters in Christ and when you greet them, greet them with Maranatha. Well, you know, when you get on up in years, you don't always able to keep up with everything and some words get a little mixed and sound like others. But man, this woman just took this thing to heart and said, all right, I'm going to do it. I can't wait. Can you imagine the surprise on all of them's face as she went around the conference the whole next day, and every time she'd greet somebody, she'd say, marijuana, brother, marijuana. Battling a tendency to coast. These Hebrew Christians had gotten tired. A lot of time had passed since they were first fired up for Jesus. It's been 500 years since they had received the promised land. Hebrews 10, 32 and 33 says, Remember those earlier days after you received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. That's what we're supposed to do on days like this. To remember, to look back, never forsake the assembly, the fellowship, the cause for Christ. Hebrew further tells us that though this, by this time you ought to be teachers, it says some of you need to be taught the basics all over again. What's he saying? Meaning there's no growth in the believer. They're stagnant. They're content with coasting through their salvation. Church, listen, we can't afford to do this. They have began to coast. And as it tells us in Hebrews 2 verse 3, to neglect so great a salvation. The situation is serious. The writer suggests that they are showing signs that their faith 
or some of them, their faith is phony and they have tasted the powers of the age to come in vain. Faymont turned 71 years old this year. Now, to some churches, we've been around a long time. How easy it is for a church to get tired and begin to coast or to get diverted with maintenance ministry or to get careless in spiritual vigilance or to quench the Holy Spirit with passionless, dead, dutiful religious exercises. How real is the danger? And the book of Hebrews was written to keep it from happening. Look at chapter 12, verse 1 again. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. It's a trumpet call. That's what Hebrews 12, 1 is. It's a warning gun. Like they use at the racetrack. You know how they start the races with that track? This is the warning gun that the last laps of the race are starting. See your life as a race to be run with passion and zeal and energy and discipline. God says, lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely or distracts. He means basically get serious. Get serious about the race. Focus. Throw off anything that's going to slow you down. Test yourself. I wonder today, as a believer, are you running or are you coasting? You can get back in the race this morning. How? Verse 1 says, throwing off these weights and sins. Throwing them off. That means getting things out of your life that make you more worldly minded and putting things in your life that make you more heavenly minded. It means to get serious about praying. Start your day with prayer. End your day with prayer. Have prayer throughout the day. Get serious about hiding God's Word in your heart and spending some serious time in God's Word. Meditate on it. Exhort one another. Take up your cross. Present our bodies as living sacrifices. To put on the armor of God. To resist the devil. You know, the great danger of every aging church and every aging denomination and every aging person, which is all of us, is to begin to coast instead of run. We begin to coast and fiddle around instead of fight. To this, the writer of Hebrews and I and God say this morning, there's a better way to come to the end of life. Namely, run till you can't run any longer. Run till you ran your last step. Fight to the very last moment. Doing your best for Christ and His church. So what I want to do is show you three motivations real quick this morning in this race in our 71st year. God doesn't call us to meaningless, exhausting drills like laps around the field that ain't going to get us anywhere. Or meaningless worship to go through the motions. Or singing praises just to fill the time. He has called us to a great race with a great goal. Goals that have a powerful incentive along the way, not, as, not to mention beyond the finish line. So here's the first motivation. Looking back to witnesses. Look at verse 1 again. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. As we run the race at Faymont, there is a big, dense cloud of saints pressing in along both sides of the track, watching. They, throughout Christendom, they have preceded us. They have strived as we strive today. The saints of chapter 11 along with those Christians before us. How many here, how many families have done that at Faymont Baptist Church since 1948? It began with the Collins family. You saw the four original sisters up there in one of the pictures. And there has been a multitude of them since. The Bryants and Galts and Warners and Edwards and Stouts and Williams and Jordans and Websters. And the list goes on and on and on and on. So many more. Saints who strived, who the focal part of their life was Jesus Christ and his church here at Phamon. It was all about them advancing the gospel who by their character, their commitment, and their dedication to this church 
helped Fremont to continue in its quest for lost souls. They finished the race. And now the Bible says they circle around. They, they press into the crowd along the route where the rest of the racers are still coming, coming into the finish line. Now, how is this supposed to motivate us? Two ways. Remember this. It can be done. It can be done. It will be done. We remember their diligence for this church on homecoming. Their devotion was not in vain. Look at us today and what God is accomplishing. We are running the race and we look out into the crowd and realize that every one of them has finished the race. We can feel it. And they're telling us and reminding us and shouting if we're listening, it can be done. It can be done. It will be done. We look in people's lives that we've known and seen personally. We have characters throughout God's Word here in the Bible. We see examples of faith and perseverance under every imaginable circumstance. We got people like David who committed adultery and murder. But guess what else he did? He finished. He finished. He finished the race and the fight. There's John the Baptist who had a very weird personality, but he finished. There's Joseph who was sold into slavery, but he finished. And Mary the prostitute, and she finished. And Job, who suffered more than any man that we know about in history, and it wasn't even because of anything he had done wrong, but he finished. Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church, who was hated and stoned, but he finished. By the power and the faith that got them through. See, I don't know about you today, but I can tell you one thing for certain. I'm going to finish too. I'm going to finish too. Through the power and the faith of God, I'm going to finish. That's the first way these witnesses motivate us. Something better. And all these people mentioned in chapter 11, look back real quick at the end of chapter 11, verse 39. All these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect what did he say they didn't receive what they were promised in this life and even yet because God had foreseen something better for us what is the something better the answer is in the last phrase of verse 40 that apart from us they would not be made perfect in other words the final perfected salvation of all the saints who have gone before the resurrection of the body the reign of Jesus Christ on the new earth, the restoration of all things, will not happen without all the runners finishing the race. They finish the race. They got a ribbon, but not the gold cup. And then the Bible says they basically circle around and crowd in on the sidelines of the marathon. Have you ever noticed that? If you've ever watched the Boston Marathon or one of the other, many of the runners, once they cross the line and are finished, they immediately, after they cool down, get their water, whatever, circle back around and come and begin to make up part of the crowd along the sidelines. What are they doing? They're cheering everybody who's behind them. Keep going. Keep going. You can finish. Doesn't matter your time. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Finish the race. The Bible implies that's kind of what happens in heaven. Because God says nobody gets the final glory of perfection until every single one has finished the race. When all the runners are across the line, then the joy of everyone will be even more. We will be glorified not one at a time, but all together in the great consummation of the kingdom. That's the first motivation this homecoming. Looking back to the witnesses who have gone before, they finished their course and so can you. All the saints wait with longing and excitement. Have you ever stopped and think about that? There's people you know and love, family members, friends, acquaintances that have passed on right now and are in heaven cheering for you, waiting for you. The Bible calls them a great cloud of witnesses. They're saying, come on, come on, Bill, come on, John, come on, Susan, come on, Barb, come on, you can do it, come on. I know you can, I did it. You can do it. Just keep going, keep believing.
keep running the race. Second motivation is looking up to Jesus. You know, it's very easy to hear the command of run the race and fight the fight. You've heard it for years. But obeying it's a totally different story. And see, I don't know about you today. When it comes to looking up at Jesus, I'm going to miss a few things today since we're not having a meal after service. I'm not going to get my normal fried chicken. Nobody's going to have me no devil eggs hid in there in the refrigerator anywhere. There ain't going to be no banana pudding in there. I'm sorry, nana pudding, not banana pudding. Nana pudding. There ain't going to be none of those things. And I'm going to miss some of them. But listen, if I leave here today and miss Jesus, I've missed it all. Those other things, we live in a place and time and point now, we can have basically any kind of food at our beck and call. When we leave out of here today, we can take a right or go straight or take a left. Or There's a multitude of choices and restaurants and all that stuff out there. But if I leave here today and I've missed Jesus, I've missed it all. I've missed it all. We've been called to obey to be responsible to the fellowship of the church. But the writer wants us to encourage us to look at Jesus. Look at verse 2 again. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith. You know what that means? He's writing your story. He's the author. He gave you the faith initially to believe in him. And in the meantime, he is the one who is perfecting your faith. He's working through your faults and failures and my shortcomings and all these things to perfect his faith in us. He is the author. He writes our life story. Notice also, though, he's given us a foundation of our faith from the start to finish. He is the author and perfecter. He started it. He's going to complete it. The author always begins the story. The author always completes the story. He pioneered by enduring on the cross and despising the shame. He perfected by sitting down triumphantly at the right hand of the throne of God. Our redemption, the foundation of our faith, is complete. Second, notice he gives us a model for faith. Start to finish. What did he do even as the Son of God? He trusted his Father from beginning to the end in his earthly race. Third, he is the giver and sustainer of our faith from start to finish. So the God who began a good work in us is going to complete it through Christ Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So don't even begin to think that finishing this race will rebound to your glory because it depended on your strength. We run in the strength that God supplies that in everything God might get the glory through Jesus Christ. So take a look at Jesus. That's what he tells us here, the author. Set your eyes, fix your eyes, look up. Fix your eyes on him. Trust him. Take heart and keep running. And the final motivation is looking forward to joy. The homecoming. The home going, maybe. When we look to Jesus, one of the things we see, according to verse 2, is that this perfecting work of redemption was sustained because of the joy that was set before him. Now, how, how can we equate that, the joy that was set before him, with a cross? Listen, the cross was just the obstacle to him receiving the joy. The cross was set before him, but the joy was beyond the cross. He knew what awaited him. He knew what was promised him. He endured the cross, the Bible says, for the joy set before him. There was nothing joyous about the cross. He didn't want to hang there. He didn't want to die there. If you recall, he said, Father, if there is any other way, take this cup away from me. I don't want to drink it. But yet, he endured. And we should endure the hardships of our marathon for the joy set before us. So homecomers, you need to look forward to your reward. 
Hebrews 10, 35 says, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which had a great reward. It's a deterrent to apostasy. Is the prospect of the rewards for those who believe. We know what the promises are. We know what the Bible tells us awaits us. You know how wonderful and unequal and how superior they are to anything this earth and world can ever throw at us. You know that Christ will be faithful in fulfilling it. Don't let your confidence waver now. Claim the promises. Secure the reward. Look back and remember how wonderful it once seemed. Look ahead to how even more wonderful it's going to be. Your endurance, your patience will not cause you to turn back. Your enlightenment in the gospel will not be for nothing. But are you doing it? Are you living it? Are you mastering it? The love of the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ in your heart, your confidence will not be in vain. You know, unfortunately, then such as now, many had not done the will of God fully. Many had not fully trusted in His Son, and until then, they couldn't receive what was promised. They knew the promises. They probably even rejoiced in the promises and even had suffered for the promises. The problem is they hadn't received the promises. And the church today is still filled with people like this. It's the negative side of Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Remember when Jesus says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Oh, how I pray that your soul is united to Christ, devoted to his church. It's all that's going to matter one day. What did we do for Jesus in our time on earth? Today on this homecoming, I want to invite some of you to come home to Christ again to the service of his kingdom. You know where your heart is. You know where your devotion lies. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. That is the joy that is set before you. So let us run the race. Let us all keep fighting the fight. Today I call us, plead us to be the people of faith. You know, a person of faith has quiet confidence as God is always going to take care of them. A person of faith has a quiet confidence that no matter what, God is always going to take care of them. Even though dreams may and plans may lay collapsed at their feet, they may feel trampled by life, they remember God is still in control. God has still got me in the palm of his hand. This world is not our home. We belong to another one. People of faith have a clear witness. They have a different set of priorities. They speak a different language with an eye on the eternal. People of faith realize that they're on a journey, and this world is simply one little phase of that journey that extends into the eternal realm. People of faith have the ability to distinguish between the temporal and the eternal. And people of faith stand to inherit God's blessings and provisions. It's their security. The Hebrew writer today was persuading his readers, don't turn back, don't give up, look up, look forward. And in so doing, he encourages them, as well as us, to press on. How about us today? Will Faymont be here for another 71 years if Jesus doesn't come back? Will we press on? Will we be the best believers we can be? Will we strive for God's church? Enjoy our homecomings, but we don't need to get too comfortable here. We're on a quest, and we're not home yet. I want you to think of the day when you'll be wrapped in the arms of Jesus. Just dare to imagine that moment. You will finally see the Savior you have served, trusted, and longed for. There he is the very one who gave his life for you and your redemption and brought you to faith and turned you from death to life. You know, I don't know what that day will be altogether. I don't know. I can't imagine. 
all that we're going to see and experience and all that God has in mind and in store for us? I don't know. But here's what I do know. He's going to draw us to himself. He's going to wrap his arms around us. And the very one who made us is going to say to us, welcome home. Welcome home. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. As we celebrate 71 years, 71 years, Lord, and only you know this day as we stand before you or sit before you, how many lives have been touched, changed, impacted, and brought into the kingdom of God through 71 years of ministry at Faymont Baptist Church on Cumberland Road. Lord, only you know the answer to that question. I can't wait to find out one day. But Lord, until that day, our work is not done. And we just thank you and praise you that you are still at work in our midst. That decisions of faith are still being made. That the first steps of obedience and baptism are still being taken. That our church family is still being added to in the promise of Christ himself. That I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's still being fulfilled today. So, Lord, as we recognize and celebrate 71 years of homecoming and of this church's existence, we give you the glory, we give you the praise, we give you the honor for it all. We thank you, Lord, for those saints who have come before us who are now so great a cloud of witnesses watching and encouraging us on. We pray, Father, that you help us to quit looking around and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And to just as he did, to look forward to the joy that is set before us, not to the obstacles that are in between. May we be faithful, Father, in running the race fighting the fight until that day we go from home coming to home going we pray and ask you these and all things